And I am going to um, pass it over to Alex and Vernika. So welcome, Alex and Vernika. We're so excited that you can be with be here with us tonight from GIS Core. And Alex and Vernika, you should be able to share your screen and all of that good stuff. Thank you, muted, Vernika. Okay. Alex and I are very excited about um, presenting to you about how to make a good map. So the things that we're going to go over tonight are the datum projection and coordinate system, um, the map classes and properties, um, the map elements, visual appealing maps, how to create visual appealing maps, the key areas that stand out in a map that you should be aware of, and the disadvantages and advantages of ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Online. And we're also going to try to explain how you can turn your story maps into posters. The first thing you should consider when you're um, making a map is the projection and coordinates. And the reason why this is important is because um, there is an issue with the shape of the earth and it converting to a 2D, 2D flat surface. The issue is that the earth has its bumps and curves in it and we're trying to project it onto a flat curve. So the issue, the problem becomes distortion on the flattened, flattened map. So in order to compensate for this, um, geologists and cartographers have come up with how to best measure the earth from the core or the center of the earth so that it could be projected correctly on a map. The first thing to understand is that um, datum, the datum is, is the reference point to which all the locations on the earth is measured. And there's uh, certain uh, datums that um, most, Amer most of the world uses, which is the WGS 84 datum, which measures from the core of the earth. And it helps to, it helps to um, make a more accurate map for the locations of your datum. There's also local datums that um, different regions use that are specific to their country. And it also makes it more, um, make, make, helps to provide a reference for more better measurement from the Earth's core or the surface of the Earth for your location on the Earth. Um, the things that you should consider, the next thing you should consider is the location that you're going to present your data, um, that you collect your data from rather. And the, the locations um, determine um, whether how distorted your, um, your features will be on your map. So there is the cylinder, the cylinder, which is based around the equator, which is less distorted around the equator. There's a conic, which is less distorted between the parallel, two parallel latitudes. And there's a planar that um, is less distorted on the poles. And these are things that you should consider the second thing you should consider when you're making your maps is the location of where you're putting your data. Once you know the location of your data, you should consider what, what, what spatial relationship you're trying to preserve, such as the area. 
the first, this is one of the first properties. And here I have an example of how, how to make, how this could, this could be distorted on your map if you don't choose the correct projection. Like in this first example, I have the area of Peru. In this area, in this map, it is correct. It shows the right shape and the <laughs> right um, distance between the points. But in the second map, you can see that there's distortion here. Um, the, the area is wider than the original. The points are spaced out, which makes it look like um, the population is more sparse than what it is. So in order to um, have the, the correct um, projection, the project portrayal of your data, you need to select the correct projection. And this, the first one, um, they have a datum within their own country called South America, 1969. And here, because it's between the two standard parallels, you would use, you would select CONIT, CONIT um, projection, which would make it less distorted. In the second um, slide, the second um, um, example, I have um, an example of a good way of preserving shapes. Now there's different ways you can preserve shapes. There's different projections. But in this particular one, I've chosen the WGS84 as a bad way, as a as a bad way of presenting data. And, and the, in the pose, the pose you see that is the correct way of presenting the data. But in Mercator, because it is more less distorted around the equator, the further away it is from the equator, especially in the North and South Poles, it's more distorted. So you can see that the shape is different from what it should be. This is the correct way it should be in the North Pole stereographic. You also should consider the distance when you're presenting your data on your map. You, sh you sh just consider this so that the distances that if you're measuring distances like for suitability areas or for navigation, you want to make sure that you are measuring the measuring accurately on your map. For example, although there's different different datums and different um, projections, I chose Robinson as the good projection and the Mercator as the bad projection. Because the Mercator, the equate is along the equator, is further away from this location, but the Robinson is within forty-five degrees, so it's a better present, a better um, rendition of accuracy of the direction here. So once you figure, once you um, know the location of your data and the how and what you want to preserve in your data, you can then begin to present your data. So these are different types of maps that you can make. Like for example, you can make a story map, you can make a dashboard, both of these are interactive, or you can make a link map with imagery or a reference map. And you also can make posters and thematic maps. And with that, I will pass it to Alex and she will explain to you um, how to make a more visual appealing map with the various elements of the map. All right, thank you, Vernika. So now that you all are aware about map projections and datums, and you're keeping in mind those map properties that Vernika shared, now I'm gonna go into um, when you start building your map, what elements should you include in your map and then how to make it visually appealing. So up on your screen, you can see that there are some essential elements that every map should have. And number one being, of course, your map, but we also call that a data frame. Um, you should also have a descriptive title that describes what's going on in your map. You should have a legend that includes all of the layers that your map is showing. You should have a north arrow, and that's so your viewer can understand what direction the map is facing. 
should have a scale bar. And that's a way for, again, your viewer to understand the size of the map that they're looking at. And then it's also good if you have any kind of base map or any data that you've collected from a certain source that you give that source credit within your map. So um, just really fine print in the corner somewhere. Um, if you use an Esri base map, they normally automatically have some kind of credit line in there when you're making a map. So those are the essential elements that your map should have, but then there are some optional elements that you can use to kind of boost your map up a little bit, give it a little bit more pizzazz, like you could add a border around your data frame. Um, you can also add inset maps. So if you're doing a, like a really big overview map of the whole United States, and you are focusing on certain areas within the United States, um, you can add little inset maps around your map, showcasing more zoomed in areas um, that you want to focus on. And you can also add grid lines, like some of the maps that Vernika showed us had grid lines in there just to give us some perspective. Um, and then it's also nice sometimes if you want to describe um, or write a little bit of notes about what your map is showing, that never hurts. So, and now we're going to see some visuals of a good versus a bad quote unquote bad example. So on the left, you can see this is a good map because it has a good title. The title is in a good place and it's descriptive as to what the map is showing. We've got a legend. We can read the legend. Everything is clearly marked, all the layers. We understand what we're looking at. There's a north arrow and a scale bar and those are really easy to see. And then we also have credits and sometimes your credit could be a logo a logo from a company if you're working with a company um, or a university logo whatever you happen to be working with and then on the right hand side you can see not so great example so the title is there but it's kind of in an awkward place and it's not really descriptive as to what the map is showcasing and we do have a legend, but it's kind of hard to see because it's transparent and there's some stuff going on behind it, so we can't really read it. And if you look closely, not all of the layers are labeled within the legend, so we really don't know exactly what we're looking at. And then on the bottom right hand corner, we have a north arrow and a scale bar that are way too small to even see. So there's really no point in having it in the map because the viewer can't tell how big or small the area is. So now that we know all the things we need to include in a map, we can talk about how to make all of your data more visually appealing. So first and foremost, your map should be in the center of the poster or the document. Um, that is going to be the main focal point. So you wanna make sure it's front and center. And you're gonna to wanna to usually create some visual contrast. So whether that be like a dark base map and it has lighter layers on top or vice versa with a light background and then dark layers on top, just a way that we can really see clearly the layers that you're showcasing. And then you also wanna keep in mind color scheme, which we'll go over um, in further detail in a later slide. You also don't want too many layers in the map. You only want to include layers that are necessary to help tell your narrative, tell your story. Um, because if you add too many layers, the viewer can be really confused about what they should be looking at. And you want to make sure that they know exactly what your map is trying to say. You don't want them to be confused. Um, and also, you'll hear this throughout the presentation, but you want to make sure that your layers are in order of importance, both in your map and in your legend. So you want to make sure that your most important layers are on the top of everything else or in the front of your map. And we can see some examples of that. So on the left, again, we have a good example. So we have a really dark base map. And on top of that, we have light layers. So light county boundaries and then light points. So they really stick out and we can clearly see um, everything in this map. The legend is good, it's descriptive, and also the north arrow and the scale bar and all the credits, they really stand out against the dark background. But then on the right, there's a lot going on here, um, but we have like a light base map and our important layers are also really light, like a pastel color. So they're, they're pretty hard to see. Um, so that's not good. And then we also just have a ton of extra layers, like we have 
stream layer, we have public schools, we also have airports. And if you look closely, those schools and those airports are on top of our assessment site points. Um, so the main focus of this map, we want to showcase the Western North Carolina assessment sites, and they are being covered by some of the other symbology from the schools and the airports. Um, so again, we want your those main layers to be on top of everything else. And the schools and everything else, they're really not important to um, telling the narrative of this map story, so they're really not needed. And I'm going to pass it back over to Vernika real quick to talk about color schemes and symbology. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, did you want me to share my screen again and do it from there? I don't see anyone. I'm not connected. <laughs> Am I not connected? No, we can still see you. We can oh, see you. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't let's see. Okay. I don't like I don't think many people have their cameras on. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you and I and uh, and uh, okay, well so let's see a video. The next thing that you should consider is how you how your colors will look on your map. Um, when you're dealing with uh, nom nominal um, values, these are like um, relig like religious um, numbers that, that, that display a category. And then there's uh, uh, ordinal values or interval values that have that should be displayed from dark to light colors. And then there's their divergent values, which are the America values that display from light to dark within shades of dark and light between a, a gray area or an area that separates the two shades. When you're presenting your data, there is um, different ways you can present it with symbols. One of the symbols are um, dots. These dots um, should be proportional when you're, when you're displaying them. For example, here is a presidential election and it shows the proportions of the, of the voters. So when you're um, presenting proportional data, you should be sure that they're proportional to your total data in your, in your data set. For example, if you have 100 votes, then the the size should be, for example, two centimeters. If it's or uh, two meter, two centimeters, and if it's 200, then it should be uh, four, and if it's 300, it should be six. In in other words, it's it's proportional to the the data. Here is an example of data classification of shapes. And this deals with numbers also. And here, when you're dealing with numbers, you should consider how you should consider how it's the, it displays with your values. For example, in your histogram here, it shows that most of the data is between 200 and 522. And you can see in an equal value that it doesn't display this data correctly. It's, sh it's showing more of a range from 50 to 522. 
But when you look at the natural break, it actually is showing what is in the data set. It's showing that these values are the lowest and then the next value, it goes up into and matches towards the colors. So it's always good to look at your histogram and figure out which, which type of um, way in order to display your data the best. Um, it could be like equal value and natural break or um, things such as standard deviation or geometric values. You always should consider your data and how it's gonna be portrayed. And I'll pass it on to Alex. All right, thanks. So one of the last things we'll talk about today, now that we've got the map looking good, it's visually appealing, we want to make sure our key areas are standing out. So again, we always want to keep in mind our color scheme that we're using. So Vernika gave a lot of good examples on how we can use color scheme to make your important areas stand out. But you can also label important features. Um, you can add drop shadows or outlines to polygons to make them stand out against everything else. You can also include descriptions for certain features if you want people to understand more about them. Um, and again, their top layer should be the most important layer um, out of everything else on the map. So here again, we have examples. On the left is actually a poster that I created for GIS Day last year, and I had it printed um, and hung up in downtown Raleigh. But at first glance, it's a lot going on in the color scheme. You might not really understand what you should be paying attention to. And, but in order for me to make it more obvious as to what people should be looking at, I did a few things. I added labels to all the counties that were important. I also added like a little drop shadow behind each of them. So they look like they're a little bit 3D and, and kind of kind of pop out um, against everything else on the map. And then I also on the right hand side added in descriptions for each of the key areas that I wanted people to be aware of. These were like the high priority areas um, for the case that I was working on. Um, and then also in the bottom left-hand corner, I just wanna point out, this is a legend. So the little diamond looking thing, um, it's actually called a bivariate symbology. So it's a way for you to symbolize if you have two different variables that you want to compare against each other. Like in this case, um, the two variables were percentage of food insecure people, and then the total meals distributed by the food bank. Um, so I had two variables and I use this bivariate symbology in the legend to showcase and kind of create a hierarchy of the, the most high priority areas and the highest priority being the red counties. And then on the right hand side, it's a really similar map, but you can see that there's nothing labeled. Um, the legend isn't really descriptive as to what's going on in the map and I wouldn't know what I was looking at. Um, nothing really stands out. So I'd be really confused looking at this map, um, wondering what the story is they're trying to tell. All right, so now you know how to make a great map. We're gonna talk a little bit about the software that you can use to make those maps. So one avenue you can take is using a desktop software called ArcGIS Pro. And this helps you perform complex analysis. You can run geoprocessing tools. You have a lot more options in terms of how to symbolize your points, lines, and polygons. Um, and what's really cool about it is you can work directly on maps that are hosted online. You can work on them directly in Pro, and you can also upload maps and layers um, from Pro directly to ArcGIS online. And then we have ArcGIS Online, which is provided by Esri. And this is a web GIS tool, so you need to be on the internet to use it. But it's very easy to collaborate and you can share maps with, um, with different people in your organization, if you have separate groups set up, or even with everyone in the public. 
and it's very user friendly. This picture that was taken, um, this is the web map viewer um, on ArcGIS Online, and it's very easy to use. It's very easy to navigate around and, and go through all of the different buttons and very user friendly for someone that might just be starting out in GIS. And as we talked about earlier, there's a lot of applications that we can use from WebGIS through ArcGIS Online. Like we can make dashboards, we can make story maps, we can do something called the Web App Builder where we can include a lot of widgets in our map, and then something called the Experience Builder, which is pretty similar to story maps. And your maps can also be compatible with mobile apps, so you can use them on your phone or tablets. So both of those applications do have a lot of pros, but they also each have limitations. So with Pro, this requires a license to use either a basic, a standard, or an advanced, and all of those cost some amount of money. So compared to online, it could be a little bit more expensive depending on what your budget is. And it's also difficult to collaborate. Um, you can't have more than one person working in a pro map at the same time. So that's where it can be a little bit difficult if you're working on a team and everyone's working on the same map. It might not be the best avenue to work out of that in pro. Now, if you are using ArcGIS online, you have typically less options for symbology. You can upload um, icons from online or you can upload them from your computer, but you have a limited number of how many icons you can upload to online. So that's where it's a little bit more limited than pro. Um, and of course it requires internet access. So if you don't have Wi-Fi, you can't use it. And it also uses credits um, and credits are things that you have to buy. And if you run out of them, you have to buy them again to replenish them. And credits are taken up by storage. If you run any kind of analysis online or if you generate any feature reports. So just all things to keep in mind when you're trying to decide which program to use. And then we heard some of you might be making story maps. So we wanted to try to figure out a way to show you an idea of how you can transform a story map into a poster for this specific project that you're doing. So I have an example of a story map. Let's see if I can share this screen instead. This is a story map that my team at my company um, just recently put together for a town in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. And as we scroll down, you can see there's a lot of data associated with it. We had a lot of information that our client wanted us to put in the story map. Um, but in the interest of this project where you might be taking a story map into a printed poster, um, wanted to show you how you could do that. So if I focused on one of our tabs here, which is priority habitats and wildlife, and this tab explains um, all the habitat areas within Pittsburgh, North Carolina. And as you scroll down the story map, you can see that for each habitat, some of the, some of the species are highlighted, showcasing that they're native to those habitats. And it will change as you scroll down. So it's really cool and interactive. But if you wanted to make a print version of this, then we would want to usually focus, I would recommend focusing on either one of those tabs in your story map or just really general information from each tab. So I chose to focus on that priority habitats and wildlife tab from my story map. And I just really simply included a an area of Pittsburgh, North Carolina, and I pointed to where each of those um, each of those species called home. And you can see that even though it's a printed map from a story map, it still includes all those essential map elements that we talked about earlier. So a title, a legend, north arrow, scale bar, and credits. And the arrows are pointing to those significant areas. So that's how the viewer knows what they should be looking at. And here's another example that you, you might see more regularly if you're going to like a conference or um, a lot of college students will do posters like these. And this is another poster that I've made um, where I took it from a presentation that I had done and I wanted to 
put it into a poster to display at a conference. So you can see there's several maps technically in this poster, but there was a process behind something that we did for a project. So that's where the introduction, the reasoning, the methods, the results, that's where all those come in. So if that's something that you're doing, um, if you're performing some kind of process that ends up with some kind of results and you want to showcase it like this, then this is a very common way to do so. So in conclusion, initially you'll want to make sure you're thinking about your map projection, your coordinate system, the datum, and your poster size. It's really important to know upfront how big your poster is going to be because we don't want to find out later on down the line it needs to be smaller or larger because then like Vernika told us it's going to really like distort everything that's going on. So we need to figure that out upfront and be prepared for that. And keep in mind those map properties, so the shape, the area, and the distance and direction. Make sure to include those essential map elements at the bare minimum. And just make sure your map is visually appealing. Um, if you think it looks good, then odds are a lot of other people think it looks good. So go with your gut on that. And make sure your key areas stand out one way or another. Add labels, um, add drop shadows to make things pop out a little bit. And then with all this information, just determine which software is gonna work best for your needs, whether that be ArcGIS Pro or online. And just a little tip, make sure whatever platform you use, just save your map often. You really don't want all your hard work um, to be lost and go to waste. So just make sure you're hitting that save button very often. To take it from me as someone that has lost plenty of work from just not hitting the save button. Um, so, that's it from us and yeah we will share this link with you all this is a google slides presentation and we have a few um, slides after this that you can look into there's a lot of good resources and links and visuals that you can you can turn to when you're creating your maps so we'll share this link with everyone and that's it from us we'll take any questions Um, in ArcGIS Online, how would uh, one change the type of datum the uh, ArcGIS Online uh, uses to display your map? Um, you will go under um, geoprocessing, geoprocessing tools, and you will just simply go to define projection, and then you just okay. link your, yeah, you just link your data in and then select your um, projection and your coordinate system. OK, Wait. thank you. I think we got a question in chat. Yeah, Faith, yeah. And, uh, Faith and Hope are asking, what tutorial videos do you recommend for beginners, for beginner GIS users? Yeah, um, Esri, if you're familiar with Esri, we can pop this also in the in the resources link that we sent. But Esri has a lot of good tutorial videos, um, and they're free for the most part. So we can recommend um a link to that they have a ton of information i mean literally any anything you can think of esri usually has um a video tutorial on how to do it and usually step-by-step -step, um walk through instructions on how to do certain things Any additional questions for Alex or Vernika? Can you make custom base maps just out of curiosity? All right. Yeah, you can. Um, I haven't had much experience with that myself. Esri provides a lot of really great base maps, and they usually take care of what I need to do for any project. Um, 
but yeah, you can. And again, like if you Google's my best friend for anything, um, when it comes to GIS, I'm still learning day to day on, on so many things. And I just Google, like, how do you make your own custom base map and something will come up. Someone has done it before. Um, but we can also include a link to that too at the end of this presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Another thing you could look at um, imagery if you wanted to uh, create it from scratch, uh, like editing and creating your own uh, shapes and lines and roads and things like that, you can just uh, trace from the imagery. That's the way you can make your own custom base map. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question, Clay, uh, or hope, or, or, or both. We will have to check with uh, Dr. Ray on that. Um, we'll get back to you. We'll send an e uh, uh, another email with the deadline. It's usually like June or something, I think, or like late May. Yeah, yeah, I think it's probably middle to end of May. Well, thanks both to Vernika and Alex for spending time with us tonight to talk about how to make a, a nice maps. Um, we're excited to go to San Diego and hopefully bring a whole lot of maps and reserve the gallery. So um, if you have any additional questions, uh, we will send out this, this Zoom call is being recorded. So we'll share a link to this Zoom call as well as our PowerPoint presentation with additional information. So um, but, uh, thanks again for spending time with us tonight. Um, Dr. Ray had to step off, so I'm going to take over for just a minute with some updates. Uh, we might actually get off a little early from nine tonight. Uh, first of all, though, I would like to welcome Team Massachusetts. They are officially part of our team. So we have uh, Kim Pond, and then we have Faith and Hope Mata, uh, which uh, Faith and Hope have been involved uh, for the past few calls, as well as we saw them at the Healthy Living Summit in Washington, D.C., so let's give them a big round of applause. We're excited to have you all. If you have any other states that are interested in being a part of our team, please uh, feel free to let them know. Our applications now are a rolling cycle, so you don't have to apply. Traditionally, you, you had to apply by a deadline to be on the team, and now we're kind of doing a rolling cycle, um, so uh, we're excited to see more growth. Um, we have a couple updates for San Diego. Now, we have a small group here tonight, but um, I guess of the states that are here, I know what states uh, we need to make. A, our deadline is May 17th for San Diego in terms of booking hotels. Um, do you all know, Kim, if, any, if anyone from Massachusetts is going to be attending the conference in person? No, we won't be able to go this year, but our plan is to get on board and learn. And if there's any like online opportunities, sometimes virtual or in that, we're going to try to jump on some of that this year. Awesome. Great. Great. And I see you. Have, yep. Faith and hope will make a map. Great. Great. Um, and you can definitely do that. So please uh, let us know. We'll we'll make sure to reserve map panels uh, for everyone, regardless of your attendance of, of the conference. Um, Let's see who else we have. I know now, Brock, you're not going to be able to make it. I heard, right? Is that still correct? Yeah, I've got a uh, beach that week, so I can't make it, but I will be uh, submitting a map. It's actually gotten a little late, I think, for the North Carolina GIS conference. So I was hoping to submit my map to that and the uh, Esri Users conference, but it turns out I won't be able to make it to the North Carolina competition. So I'm probably just going to have to uh, roll with it and submit it to the Esri conference. but. I will try to um, get it by then. Okay, oh, cool, cool. And we'll send a follow-up email uh, regarding all the things tonight, as well as the deadline for the map gallery, because I know that's one thing I don't have, so I'm gonna write a note on that. We'll send that out to let everybody know um, when that is. 
Uh, now, Team California, who do we have? I know Vidya said she she was not on the call. I think we have, let's see, uh, did the theater, Panit, and a couple of names I'm not recognizing. Pardon me if I'm not familiar. Is there other people from Team California? And do you all know if you all are going to attend the conference, Panit? I don't think there's anyone else here in California, but I'm planning on attending the conference. You are. Okay, great. 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 How, do you know how many from California are planning to attend? Or, or who will be, who is going to be, because I, I don't think, is Vidya and Sudi, they're not coming, right? Is that correct? Uh, I think for now it's just going to be me and Sassy Reka, but I'm not completely sure she's coming. Because she even said that it's a 50-50 chance. Okay. Now, do you have a adult chaperone that's going to be attending with you? Yeah, my dad's said Okay. Me. Okay, great, great. And just because I'm curious, what hotel will we, will we be staying at? It is the um you to ask that question. I'm trying to remember what name. It's it's the one to the left of the convention center. So it's right next to the Marriott. And we'll say it's a Hyatt. It's the Hyatt. Um make sure that's right. Uh, yeah, it's the Grand Manchester Grand Hyatt. Yeah, there we go. There's Dr. Ray. Yeah, the, the, it's the Manchester Grand Hyatt. And like I said, we will send an email out um, after the call or tomorrow. So we will need everyone to kind of let us know, ideally by the end of this week. I think we've technically got to the 17th, which is middle of two weeks from Wednesday. But we'd like to know sooner than later who will be attending, because we do have a block of rooms available. Um, but we, we will have to make those reservations by the 17th. And anybody that, that does not decide by that point will have to let go of those rooms uh, from the block. So, um, thank you. And just to clarify there that individual teams will have to um, reserve their own rooms in the block of rooms. Uh, that's not something I'm going to be doing for for others. We did get the block of rooms, but you have to reserve your own room. Now, Dr. Ray, is there anything else that I'm missing now that you're I don't think there's anything else that was my notes um, that I had. I think that's all. Um, I don't have anything else on my list. And welcome. I didn't get to say, you know, join in the cheers for Welcome Team Massachusetts. We're really glad you're with us. Cool. Cool, cool. Okay. Well, I think that's uh, got us in a good spot. Thanks again to, uh, to 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 Alex and Bernika for uh, tuning tonight and uh, for your expertise. Uh, we're excited to see how everyone will will use those uh, the things you learned from the the presentation to, to make your maps look the best. And hopefully, we'll have some uh, math winners this year as we've had in the past. So, I think North Carolina had a, a multiple wins last year. So, that's an exciting time to be in the map gallery. Um, for those of you that are attending um, the conference, we will have an opportunity to be in the map gallery and share about our team. And um, so we'll have a little setup. We've been working with uh, Charlie, who uh, is is over education with Esri. Uh, they always save us or reserve us a spot uh, in the map gallery. So we're, we're we're excited about that again this year to have that spot so we can share. Um, uh, so it's a space. I do want to chime in there. I think that's a great point. And so just to, to be clear um, that the expectation is that everyone on the team, whether you're going to be with us in San Diego or not, we still want your print maps to hang in the gallery. 
So this process, you know, tonight again, you know, as Austin just said, thank you, Alex and Vernika. We we really appreciate that presentation. Um, we also, though, um, need you to follow through. So at the end of this month, you will have your first draft of your maps due, and then we'll turn around and. Um, Alex and Vernika are going to critique those. They're going to meet with you one on one. Uh, well, one on two, because one of us adults from the team will be on the call with you as well. But then you'll have the chance to finalize those before we print them for the for the gallery. So again, the expectation is whether you're going to San Diego or not going to San Diego, we'd really like you to make a map. And I know some of you are brand new to this. We are we stand ready to help you get your map together and it doesn't have to be you know uh, uh advanced level expert level map it's okay to be a beginning level map um and i believe do you have the dates there alex or vernica i don't have any paperwork in front of me i want to say it was like may 26 is that sound yeah. right mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. okay so may 26 is when those that first draft of maps is due and again uh, you've got folks here that will help you get that first draft uh, together, and um, a, and it can be a very straightforward, uh, basic map to tell a, a simple story. But uh, it'll be fantastic no matter what you create. Yeah. And back Thank to you, Austin. Cool. Well, I think that's uh, got us covered. So we'll we'll end with, with twelve minutes early. So, if you have any questions, feel free to let us know. And hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, I'm signing off. Thank you, Vernika and Alex, for your presentation. That was awesome. And I'll see you all soon. Bye.